I am going to start with a brief introduction. First of all, good evening, good morning, good afternoon. Um, and I welcome all of you very heartily to this virtual walkthrough of two exhibitions, two selected exhibitions currently on view, if it wasn't for COVID, we can go into that later, at M Plus in Hong Kong. M Plus is Hong Kong's new museum of 20 and 21st century visual culture, broadly defined, um, that opened in uh, to the public on November 12th um, last year. My name is Jane Debevoise, and I'm the chair of Asia Art Archive in uh, America, the co-chair in Hong Kong. And I just wanna tell you a tiny little bit about Asia Art Archive in America. If you don't already know, it's the Brooklyn-based hub of Asia Art Archive in Hong Kong, which we call our mothership. And in both New York and Hong Kong and in New Delhi, India, where we have an office, we are a nonprofit library or reading room. Um, we are an on-site access point for our vast digital archive of material or research materials and primary materials. And we are a platform for workshops, screenings, discussions and presentations, just like the one that we are hosting, happily hosting here tonight. Our focus, much like the focus of M Plus, is on recent art from and of Asia. We are thrilled tonight to be co-collaborating, to co-presenting this program with our friends at China Institute. And now I'd like to hand the Zoom mic over to Dinda Elliott, who is the Director of Programs, to say a, first, a few words um, first, and then I will be back. Thank you so much, Jane. Um, I just want to say that China Institute is absolutely thrilled to be co-presenting this program alongside Asia Art Archive. Thank you so much for the opportunity, Jane and Hillary, behind the scenes. Um, so China Institute's mission, as many of you know, is to uh, uh, help deepen understanding of China. And we, of course, believe that art is a bridge that connects us all. And at this time of heightened geopolitical tensions, what could be better? than to celebrate this spectacular new world-class museum in Hong Kong that brings us all together. Um, China Institute's gallery has been closed for some time while we've been under construction, but I just wanted to quickly mention that we are very excited that we will reopen in the fall of 2022 with a magnificent show of Chinese ritual bronzes from the Minneapolis Institute of Art. I hope you will all come and visit when that opens. And we're just so excited tonight to see the galleries of M Plus. Back over to you, Jane. Thank you again from China Institute. Yeah, no, no, it's perfect. Um, Dinda, thank you very much. And um, now I'm gonna go introduce our two speakers. The two speakers today are P. Lee, the senior, uh, the SIG senior curator and head of curatorial affairs at M Plus and Yokoyama Iko, lead curator of design and architecture at M Plus. Their full bios, we're not gonna go into that because we have very short time and a lot to cover. Their full bios are linked um, in the chat box. So please take a look at that now. Um, they're also extremely um, active curators and uh, experts in the field and there's information on them and M Plus um, on various websites and in, um, in the, metaverse. Um, we'll start tonight's evening uh, by hearing from Eco first uh, and her exhibition, which was the opening exhibition called Things, Spaces, and Interactions. Um, and Eco will be follow Eco's presentation, which will take about uh, 20 minutes, will be followed by a presentation by P. Lee, who um, is with the exhibition is called the M plus SIG collection, revolution to globalizations. As I said, these, ex these presentations will take about 15 to 20 minutes, 20 minutes. Um, and then we'll turn it over to about 15 minutes, 10 to 15 minutes of Q and A. And we really want questions because this is a great opportunity. And I don't know whether this is possible, but if we can't get to all your questions, because I will try to, you're gonna put them in the Q and A, I will moderate and I will um, get to the questions uh, as many questions as possible answered, but of course you'll probably have many, many more. Um, perhaps we can um, screenshot those questions and send them off to um, the curators 
uh, afterwards, so, so at least they will see what your reactions are and what your concerns or, or questions might be. The event, as I said, is roughly one hour. Um, put your questions in the Q&A box. It's going to be recorded. So if you missed part of it or can't see it today, I don't know how you would know you can't see it today, but anyway, whatever. Um, we will be uh, posting it on our website soon. And we'll also live stream this on Facebook. And if you're seeing us through Facebook, please feel free to post your questions. We have somebody monitoring Facebook and we will, they will relay those questions to us. In no for um, just soon, let's now go over to Eco. Eco, are you there? And um, I really look forward to hearing what you have to say and thank again to everybody for joining us to, uh, today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jane. Thank you, Dinda and Hillary, and uh, good evening. And then for thank you for AJ Archive America inviting us, uh, PD and I'm today. So let me share my screen. Uh, come on in a sec. So do you see my presentation? Yes. So thank you. So yes, it's the, the museum is kind of the, since the idea is 15 years and then we started working on this particular exhibitions kind of last five years so it's four or five years in making so it's it's quite really a, the trailer or the very very brief about uh, to talk about this exhibition in 20 minutes so so I give uh, the quick overview which uh, Jane said think spaces interaction. So this gallery, it's focused on design, architecture, uh, the collections, uh, which we have built the collection since 2012. Uh, it's showcase, yes, it is a highlight, but it's more important to represent our strategies and topics, which has been exploring through our collection building. Uh, including uh, this gallery is about 1,700 square meters, and it's including 500 works, which had a profound influence in Asia and across the globe from uh, about over the last 70 years. So it's our focus collection point is like the post-war to contemporary. We have a few examples of the pre-war when it becomes important to inform the design architecture development movement after the post-war. And then also importantly, this is the first kind of exhibition exam transnational design architecture in Asia. So the, in Asia, there is no uh, very proper design or architecture museum exist. Uh, so there's a few like uh, the kind of archives, they're looking at the, the, some, the national agendas, but this is a kind of really the first way that we kind of looking through transnational Asia. And then this gallery is divided in five sections, as you see in the discolors. Uh, this exhibition there is a larger focus at play in this region, including social and economic change in global context, and show how design architecture gives us a window onto questions that are deeply relevant to our lives today. So we have uh, works from the historical works as well, but it's always kind of the relevant, put it in a relevance why today. And then my dream, uh, the wish, uh, so to say, of this exhibition is because it's impossible to digest all the works and analytics, but it gives us some inspiration. And then, you know, when they people walk to the museum and then on their way home, maybe you start to look a little bit a different way. Maybe the rubbish bin or MTR, like the, the card or the system, everything is a design. So it's our lived world is surrounded by design architecture. So I hope the audience will start a little bit pay more attention to their own lived world through this exhibition. That's the kind of larger goal. So then the first, uh, the gallery, uh, we uh, the room, uh, we call it as Hong Kong as a lens. So I the, <clears throat> explain why what I mean. The, the looking at the design architecture from position, uh, our position in Hong Kong, we draw from the city's unique character as uh, the site of exchange between Asia and the rest of the world. The through Hong Kong perspective, we juxtapose uh, similar or shared strategies in design architecture we can also find in other parts of the world. 
So it's, it means it's not only the, the works by the Hong Kong makers and the, the makers. So we carefully really juxtaposition it to share the strategies and the similarities. It's how to, we don't isolate Hong Kong as a, this is Hong Kong. So we put the Hong Kong immediately to the, the contrast. So one example of the war, what I mean by that. So here it's the, the section called formal informal urbanism on the big uh, the wallpaper in the back, it's called Mei Fu Xin. It's uh, the uh, 60s, uh, the, the large housing complex development. It was the largest housing complex in the world at the time, made Hong Kong very famous. But also this little, uh, the photography on the wall, this is the picture of the Hong Kong wallet city. So that's also Hong Kong was very famous. This was a kind of complete opposite. It's more informal grassroots, uh, anything goes, it's absolutely no, the regulation uh, highly unorganized in the government perspective, but it was highly organized for the living people's perspective. So the Hong Kong's this coexistence, the highly organized uh, and then also highly, you know, more the organic way of this two coexistence make Hong Kong as a Hong Kong and it's a strength of the city. But that's also these strategies, kind of dual strategies, very important to the urban development. So we are juxtaposing with two exhibitions. I'm sorry, I can't really showing the detail of the work, but the one in the middle, <coughs> it's supposed to the urbanism. It's, it's a Shenzhen-based architect. They're responding to the, you know, the late 80s when the Shenzhen became breakneck speed of the re, uh, the, the urbanization when the Shenzhen becomes special economic zone defined by Tom Xiaoping. Uh, so then they were also trying to how to preserve the wisdom in the urban villages uh, while there's a skyscrapers kind of growing like a bamboo around them. And then on the right one is uh, also the, another project from India. Uh, it's from uh, Arabs. It's, a, uh, it's an, uh, the group uh, been working in Dalabi in Mumbai. So Dalabi is, uh, the many of you know, it's the, the Asia's largest slum. So in such a place, they need a both top down and a bottom up. Any support is needed to change their life. So in their case, they've been working with the, 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 the people living there to, to imagine together how the, their future home look like, how they want to live. So, so it's this, so the strategy is kind of the, the it's a rather glass loops. It's also, that's more like a creativity because it's a government to do this an agenda, but we are also the highlighting the, the architects and then the designers to how they also they embrace the creativity in the more the informal uh, the structures. So the second rooms uh, designed for national identity. So this is the one the probably most historical uh, the section which we cover actually works from the early 20s until like the 70s. So this gallery looks how designers and architects in Asia played a pivotal role in crafting local and national identities within the global context, reflecting the post-war Asia's economic boom and burst, uh, accelerated the global exchange, and then also the post-colonial urbanism and economic reconstruction. So you can see different from the production manufacture, which boosting the exports and import to earning the foreign currency was important, also creating the job to the people uh, through the manufacture was very important. And then also the, the architecture project. Um, so for example, the here it's like more the building focus, like there's a national agenda. So we have example from like India, you know, to the post-independent in India, invited a Swiss architect to build the entire new city, to Jeffrey Bauer, Sri Lankan architect, they kind of embrace the, the regional modernity. But it's also the cities like during the post-war was in the national events, Asian Games, Olympics, it's also very important to the, to use to rebuild their infrastructures and then also their new nation was manifested in through the stadium buildings or the museums and civic uh, the architecture was really booming uh, through that time. Oops, sorry. Just, uh, sorry, you see my slide. Yeah. Okay, sorry, I lost it a bit. And I'm going to going back. So, so that, that's the architecture part. And then it's also the, 
So architecture is building the cities, but it's also same time making the better life for the people. So everybody's devast, you know, the, the time of the devastation of the, the, the war from the occupation and then different posts in Asia, post independence, post colonial, post Cold War. So everybody was striving for the new life, but it's also to make their own, um, the economy going. So there's many life-changing products came around that time. But also one example I wanted to, to talk about is here, the Sony Walkman, so from 1988. So this is the, the, one of the products really changed the way how we consume the music. It's, it's a, became a, you know, it made the music to go. So you have a very immersive uh, experience. You can hear all music. But if we look this object from today's perspective, this was really the beginning of our uh the isolation isolation culture or how should i say like you know today everybody have a per person you know own device per person everybody has ipad everybody has a phone you know and then to also even have a at the home you have a netflix but the five family members can tune in five different movies you know until before the sony walkman people have to share to listen the radio and tvs and uh, the vinyls so so this is a, something was made something very uh, the dreamlike innovation, but it's also kind of predicted something what's it long run changing our life habits such a gradually. So that, that's why we really wanted to show this products and then also the rice cooker was not also again it's not only lift the, the 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 women's who was making the you know the fire the stove cooking rice six hours in a day to so eat the meals. But it's, this is just one finger you can cook the rice. But this starts to also allow them, mother can go to the work in, at the factory early in the morning, and the father can come home later to have a still warm rice. So that's also start to symbolizing how the family's meal time has changed, how the behavior of the, uh, the way of living has changed those, by those technologies. And then one is because it's this so therefore the US audience maybe was also interesting. This on the right side on the textiles. Um, so the uh, Thailand was very unique. Uh, was one of the, the not uh, colonized the, the, the country in the in Southeast Asia, and then was the during the Cold War. So the US was uh, the very present in Thailand. So it's a lot of the fundings and the support came to Thailand. So the Thai silk company, it's known as more like a Jim Thompson. So the American entrepreneur. So he came to Thailand in late forties uh, and then to start this revitalize the Thai silk industry. So it's interesting things. He straight went to the chemical dye. It's brought from Switzerland to achieve this bright vivid color because he was listening to the people in living there. So they were using a natural dye, but they usually comes off to their hands and so they didn't really like it and they loved it, this more stable fixed color and the bright and the, today we think it's almost Thai textile it's like it is very bright color but it's yes it is it became so but it's brought by Jim Thompson and then also on the left side the the, the design ties so Jacqueline Branford Ayer is uh, the, the female Afro-American uh, designer she trained as a fashion illustrator in New York and the Paris, but she also uh, moved to Bangkok and then they ran into the Jim Thompson and he encouraged her to start the ready to wear garment business in Thailand. So this was Rockefeller uh, kind of funded her to start the, this is the, the business. So the, her dress was really sold at the very high end department store in New York and San Francisco, as I know. So it was almost a bit like a kind of the, the Thailand of Marimekko. It was around the same time. It was um, the very popular. And then the, the third room, it's called the Future Cities. So as the, the, the modernism post-war times, everybody got the, the house, everybody got the, the products, and then you know, they got kind of necessity what they wanted. But then of course, it's the people start to question, is this the life we want? So then in the 60s was a many, the, the architects start to question about the, our living, uh, the way of living and then our, what's our future is heading. So then the one is significant, uh, the group is Archigram. It's a British uh, architect. They were active in 60s. 
And the, the Empress acquired the entire archive, the archigram, which is consists of over 25,000 uh, uh, drawings and sketches and so forth. But here we also, again, it's the archigram is important uh, in the world architecture history, but why in Asia and then why, um, why today? So, so those days, maybe 60s, was maybe slightly the idea was imaginative and the, the radical, but maybe technology wasn't really there yet. So they're mostly known as unbuilt architects. But then today, the, this part of the world still, it's, the, it's, you know, it's progressively still really need to build, to rebuild. So the archigram folks say that it's, there's a relevance the, the, with the technology and this possibility of this much more um, agile like urban development in Asia. So he thought maybe the Archigram's idea in 60s maybe it's much more relevant today in Asia. And also we have one example, Zaha Hadid, as we know, she became very important architect today, but also her first project, she won the competition uh, was in the peak block. It's actually in the competition in Hong Kong uh, in the 80s. So again, this was unbuilt, and then also probably as you see the painting over, so you can't really see what it, which one is really the building. So, but there was this imaginative way, and then but today's technology, we can do something very different. And then one also example like this, we also really want to highlight how the Asia and the rest of the world was connected. So this is a one example. Buckminster Fuller is also very important, the father of the the architects who also, you know, the saving us idea of this um, green and technology merged uh, the view of the world. But Bucky, in the, he died uh, in the 80s. And then the, the last about 10 years of his life, he spent a lot of time in Bali. And he's been uh, actively uh, exchanging ideas with uh, the architects from Singapore and Malaysia and from Bali and then organizing like a lot of the workshop. And this is a just, there's a kudoms built in bamboo in Bari forest. And then this, uh, the Tagen is uh, the local Barinese painter was inspired from this uh, workshop and made a very beautiful painting. So then the loom four, so the, sorry, just checking, am I okay with doing this? I tried to be quicker. So this is the anything goes, it's postmodern design. So we are very interested in the postmodern design, which is again, also the reaction from the modernism, highly function and then the, the clean uh, design, but the postmodernism, it's kind of much, it's embraced the idea. So it's much more inclusive. Uh, it's allowed to multi-layered and then also the not afraid to be just on the surface. Uh, but it's because surface also has a strength or so something it's really fitting to our time and then also to the way of the strategy in Asia. So we are actually kind of arguing the postmodern hasn't ended in Asia. So we, we are kind of stretching the idea of the postmodern uh, time and also highlighting some important contribution from Asia. The postmodernism in a was very Western theory, but it's many Asian designers also contributed to argument those idea. The one figure is Kuramata Shiro was by bringing a poetry of a material design. And here I show you a very quick uh, video about the Kyoto no Sushi Bar. So it's 1988 design built sushi bar, which stood in Tokyo in Shinbashi. We, we uh, installed here in the gallery, just, just a sh super short video. So, oops. So that that the sushi bar is actually the, it's the one to one scale. So now audience can go in, and then it's thankfully it's really highly popular. So at the moment, it's a really long line, and then also the post modern. We have a few other examples. Maybe just a quickly, it's the Iron Pace. Uh, it's the, the the American Chinese, the Chinese American architects uh, who built a lot, but it's also this was the. the he also kind of reappropriating his own roots. Uh, so the Suzhou, uh, 
the Flagland Hill Hotel was his one of the first project he made uh, he built in back in China. And uh, we have a one lamp, it's beautiful, like at uh, the desk lamp, which uh, including Iqfazones, so it's enamel techno technique. It's a lot of Western kind of office uh, looking the lamp, but it's if you look at the very close, it's very beautiful enamel and the bronze work here appropriating the Chinese crafts. And then the last section, so we also wanted to end uh, this exhibition by rather open-ended with the questions, but it's also highlighting the, how the, the designer's role has changed. So we have a questions, where's the need? Where does the hands and the machine begin? How do we interact? Who is the author? Where is the nature? So one example, it's also like the, our uh, digital culture. So we have acquired the emoji the also because it's sometimes Asia, you know, it's everybody needed to work together. As you know, so it, emoji is actually the Japanese innovation in 98, but it took 10 years to become global language because it's, it's emoji is still today's very important phenomenon, but the Japanese didn't imagine to export to the, the world. So it was the US, it was a Google, uh, so the potential of this, the, uh, the, the innovation. So then they put it in the Unicode and an iPhone 5, uh, install the first emoji, then it become a world language and so forth. So that's again, it's like a unique the idea, but it's also how it's collaborate. And then this also where it's in nature is one, the last one, uh, it's a Levitor Cohen. Uh, so this is a look like a junkyard, but this is a one uh, office, Bancraft office from Amsterdam. And then, uh, so they extract the to uh, shed the light on how our technology exhausting the, the precious metal. So they are kind of re reverse engineering, extracting the minerals like a copper, titanium, and then the titan and so forth. And then to make it as a little gem to just, you know, the, the, to be aware of this, the nature exhaustions and so forth. So this is the, yeah, so it's, it's a lot of question. And so it was very, quick introduction. So thank you. Uh, I'm happy to discuss more, but I hand over uh, my Zoom mic to P. Lee. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm P. Lee, six senior creator and uh, um, head of the creator affairs. So I'm very happy to have this opportunity to introduce um, our opening display of the M plus C collection. So I would, if I may, I would like to begin with a very short video, and then uh, we can um, we can uh, go uh, moving for for forward. How should we appreciate contemporary Chinese art? This deceptively simple question, in fact, touches upon a depth of factors outside the world of art. Perhaps you can find the answers in M plus C collection, from revolution to globalization. M plus C collection contains over 1,000 works of contemporary Chinese art that encompass a broad range of styles and mediums. You can get a glimpse of new, sometimes radical approaches to art making that characterize the ethos of the Chinese art scene from the early 1970s to the 2000s. This remarkable flowering of experimental artistic practices in China is actually a reflection of the unprecedented transformation of the country that emerged from the rubble of the Cultural Revolution and ventured into its reform and opening up era and beyond. This exhibition invites you not only to revisit the short history of the emergence of contemporary art in China, and its conversations and impact on the global art scene, but also to reflect on the political, social, and economic metamorphosis that begot this cultural dynamism. In this exhibition, you can see around 200 works from them, exhibited in seven sections. Yeah, so um, I'm happy to um, begin with that, but the reason I want to share with you about the video is because like, uh, I really want to you guys to feel the feeling about the whole uh, space because the, the, the most exciting for us, excitement for us is that finally after so many years working for this collection, we can see all this work is on display. So before I want to talk about that, I would explain maybe 
many people already know, but I still want to explain uh, what is M plus C collection. So M plus C collection is a very generous for the donation from the formal Swiss ambassador and the Swiss major collector uh, of Chinese art, Dr. Wu Li Zi. And she, he was the ambassador for China, was the first uh, businessman who set up the joint venture in China in the 1980s. And then he became the ambassador, Swiss ambassador to China in the 90s. And while he stayed in China, he built up the most comprehensive collection of, um, of Chinese art. And by, um, by 2012, and he donated this collection uh, around uh, around uh, um, around the fifteen hundreds of of, of 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 them to M to M plus. So this collection covered the transgression from the nineteen seventies till the twenty twelve, the, the 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 year when they donated them. So we call this M plus Z collection. In fact, that's the first acquisition of the M plus, and it's already the backbone of the whole M plus collection. So I would also want to explain why we call the title because uh, when we receive the do donation, we have our commitment that with uh, in the at, at the first three years after M Plus opened, we will make a three exhibitions to introduce the whole collection to the audience internationally. So our ideas, like for the first show, we want to make a, a chronological show, which can give people a more general um, history review, history survey of Chinese art. And then we are followed with another two uh, semantic show. So we call the title show from the revolution to globalization as the subtitle of M plus Z collection. So we, we think the revolution have the two meanings here, means cultural revolution, but we all also means like the whole contemporary art appeared in the late of the 1970s. It's already a revolution, two, re two cultural revolution. And the globalization is the most significant change to Chinese contemporary art as like uh, just in the last four decades, Chinese art, contemporary art, uh, they are originally from a relatively contained environment, but soon after that, in the 80s, they received the outside information. In the 90s, China art involving the whole global circulation, and the later on, on that, and China itself totally involved in the whole globalization. So that's our major time frame to bring out the historical survey of Chinese contemporary art. So I just want to share with you like uh, how um, you, I want to walk through quickly walk, walk through with you about the, the whole show. As, as you can see, the whole Empire collection is located in the gallery suite with like 10 small galleries and, uh, and around the 2,500 square meters. So we built, when the audience came, came, came in, in the first gallery room, room, room one, we just want to show this most segregated in the show is um, from the 85 New Way to the 1989 show. The first China avant garde art show happened in the National Art Museum. That's like kind of a groundbreaking for everyone. Even the show was just opened for like several hours be shut, 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 shut down, and then and they open for se se several days, and 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 then quickly being shut down again. So that's what we really want to show this quite a historical moment of Chinese art, where artists like Wang 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 Guangyi try to deconstruct the whole like uh, pop propaganda uh, of the art, and where Zhang Peli. Gong Jianyi really like a deconstruct this kind of the sublime in the art, while uh, Huang Yongping and uh, uh, Shen Yuan take a more radical way to present this kind of conceptualism in contemporary. So the question is how, well, we see such kind of great critical moment in the 1989, then we want to know how this happened, what lead uh, what leads Chinese art and the Chinese art, art artists to this kind of stage? So we going back and uh, we go to the gal gal gallery too. So we are more thinking about the 1985 uh, new 
new new wave. Basically, we want to we review like a whole like eighty five uh, new move new move new movement, which was that the major moment for Chinese art after nineteen eighty uh, of after Cultural Revolution, where artists try out all kind of the conceptual abstraction uh, per per performance in a very short period of time. But more than that, we also want to review that. Why are this change? How are this change happen? And what are the resources for artists? Uh, there are several that I want to mention here. This very nice work by a Bulgaria artist, Maria Wambanov, who taught, uh, who was a, a East Europe student in China in the 50s. And then she studied abroad and she came back to China in the 80s and at the same year when Rauschenberg had his, his show in the National Art Museum. And the lay, lay, later on, he had the first like a Wambanov Tabastri Institute uh, in Hangzhou Academy. And that was the first time they teach this kind of the material in, in insulation to Chinese artists. And then we can also see like the whole abstraction become very interesting phenomenon in the earlier 1980s. I think if you know a little bit more, you will notice that from the 81, 82, 83, there are many, there are several international art exhibitions happen in China, China um, among them, the Boston Museum Art Collection happened in, in China, really triggered this kind of the very brave abstraction to Chinese, uh, ab ab abstraction experiment to Chinese artists. However, you also can see when Chinese artists start to pick up the abstraction as one gesture for one God, well, they don't have that many resources. So you can see they use, in, in the meantime, they dissolve the abstraction language, but they also take those resources from ink painting. You can see they are rather than go to kind of Mon the Monterey and very rational abstraction, they more use the smash. This really um, reminds you the feeling of the ink art. And then, Following this gallery, we can see on the left, the, the, the top left, then we go to the gallery three. Then we, uh, oh, uh, and before we go to that gallery three, we also can see another aspect in the 1980s. That's like the, how people refound this kind of the, rediscover the meaning or re-recognize the meaning of the body and how the body, the, 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 the desire from a socialist taboo become a new field or battlefield for them and uh, can express their uh, feeling, their dream or unconsciously. We can see the first performance in Chinese art by Wang Peng, who like in the 84, he with, without knowing if Klein, he made this very radical performance where he was students in Kafa. And where well, we can see almost like a, like a daily, like a Diary basis joints by Gu Dexin really exaggerated this kind of organ of the sexual, the gen, 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 gender thing. So that's totally cannot imagine that have happened right after the Cultural Revolution. So we want to see what's the Cultural Revolution and what's art like. I would say the main highlight for the whole show is that like uh, we also have some very nice collection of the propaganda work. And we also want to make draw people's attention to those underground art activity even before the star group, as we can see, well, we see the 1974, such like a very social propaganda work in the gallery. You also can see like a Zhang, Zhang, Zhang Wei, the leading artist from a no-name group, like try to paint in such a very small, very gray, non-optimistic landscape, quite a sentimental landscape. And we are so proud to have such a great collection of the at the first underground documentary who documented the 1979 when a group of the young artists named themselves at Star Group and had their show outside of the National Museum 10 years before the China Avant Garde art show. When the show being taken down by police and they walked it out to the street and to protest to ask for freedom of the 
speech. So that's like a way, way from the 89, we trace him back 10 years. And then if we turn left, uh, turn right from the gallery one, then we entering the 1990s, like we call it from the absence to present. Really, as people, many people know that uh, 1990s is really the highlight moment of Chinese contemporary, like uh, after 1989, and uh, in within China, like uh, Deng Xiaoping's a new strategy, like uh, really make China involved in the globalization and the commercialization and globalize, and that's like uh, a sex for John John John. John Johnson and the many uh, creators for that peer peer period, Chinese art has been introduced internationally. And it is really, really the first time bringing the Chinese art from the con container situation to a more global uh, environment. And so there see, we can see like uh, how this kind of a global art have the triggered uh, many aspect of the Chinese art, art, art. As you can see, uh, some major work here happened from the earlier 90s to, to later 2000, before the 2000. The first of the major things is kind of cynical realism and the political pop that's become the most uh, iconic textbook level book of our Chinese art. Uh, but that's like something we present in the skylight, the most dominated gallery in our in our gala, gallery. But other than that, we also want to pre 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 present the tension between this kind of the global, international, popular understand the popular style, the reflection to Chinese art, such as the cynical realism and the political book, and how in the meantime this kind of the like. Uh, and like another not a well recognized uh, uh, trend like conceptualism in China. And we can see in the 1990s such a radical performance by Chiu Zhijie writing in the Lan, Lan, Lan Ting Perfect for 1,000 one times while, uh, while Song Dong so, 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 so used the performance uh, to ex ex express his kind of like a desperate feeling in China. And it is really as kind of the opposite of this kind of commercial success of a syndicalism and the political pop. And the famous work of Wang Xinwei it used the very famous work of the uh, Tiananmen in 1989, and the in instant the photograph by Liu Kamsen, replacement of ping, ping, penguin. And her, her, his work is really challenging this kind of the, like uh, how this kind of how the Western political projection be projected to the Chinese art and, and the trigger the such kind of the success for uh, the success. And, and he's really question about the, under this kind of the projection imagination, what the China, Chinese art can do, can act. Uh, conceptualism and I use the performance, use the full photograph to anti this kind of commercial stuff success is one way. But at the meantime, we also can see in China that the whole environment changed a lot. So before we go to 2000, I want to share you the gallery five, which is a small room on the opposite. You, you can see on the top left, left, on the opposite of the cultural revolution, we call the inside and the out, out, outside. We mainly focus on the, those kind of group, like a, a self exploited art, art artists gathering together in Beijing at the East Sea, uh, East Third Ring Road, did some very radical performance. And even the village has already diminished during the urbanization. We want the inside out, out outside the documentation of the East Village as a kind of a dialogue to the, uh, to the 1979 uh, section in the Gallery 1, we call the two words, the upground, uh, the mainstream, and the and, and, uh, underground. That's kind of like it shows you this kind of social, in, in the, the very stable social environment for Chinese contemporary art. But the major change, after 1990s, uh, it's like uh, China uh, invaluable involved in this kind of a globalization. As the impact of the globalization, the major things, the urbanization, 
they should like uh, the sea city, China created so many sea cities, urban cities over like 10 minutes. And the change of the sea city is not only expanding the city, but also about the change of the in environment as in children's work, really recording those like uh, disappear the landscape in Beijing. And uh, Liang, Liang so sculpture urban present is a very socialist way, a realist way to record that kind of ignore the generation, uh, ignore the social uh, level, like uh, migrant the war, war, workers. Well, Chuyun just like copy all the public sculptures and the double the who is right to make such kind of the abstraction curly shade appear in the public space. It's quite a political work. And then we can see by from that down, we can see like a different layer or different models of urbanization in China, from Beijing, Shanghai to Peru, Dao, Dao. Dao. So urbanization really have the connection to the Eastern Village Valley, how art is relocated them into the city city, but on, uh, in, 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 in the landscape, city land, landscape. But on the other side, we also want to present the, the Eastern Village have such kind of radical attitude to the art and they use the body as their own uh, media to make Art. So we want to see like uh, at the end of the 19th, since the end of the 1990s, in the first de decade of the 2000s, and how artists develop this kind of very radical uh, expanded medias from like a media, like a body, per 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 performance to video art, and how they interpret this kind of the tradition and they re-understand in the trade tradition and the time of the his, 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 his understanding the time and also by this kind of globalization very different from those artists in the 1980s they uh, 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 abandoned departure from traditional motive in the artists in the new uh, in the 21st century they use the traditional art to re construct their uh, cultural identity under the globalization, uh, this kind of globalization um, uh, circumstance. And we can, at the end of the show, we also want to trigger those kind of the like uh, gender issue, like uh, Hu Xiaoyan use, uh, use her hair to make the, the, the embodying. Uh, one embodying to talking about like people's reflection to the female idea of female and the female's life, but the other in, 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 in body, she really presents his like a make like an understanding of her own body. So besides of that, we have another 400 square annex space where you can do some kind of in-depth presentation of Chinese art. And for this time, we want to bring the one subject. It's called the image and the text in which we want to explain the relation between the image text from the propaganda to the political art and uh, to the political pop, uh, gaudy art, until this kind of the conceptualism. And also that's the way we can see a very famous work by Wang Du, uh, created like uh, almost 20 year, year, years ago, which talking about the different uh, integration on media to the Yugoslavia war. So that's really can show us how Chinese art and how Chinese be understanding be perceived in this kind of the global international media circulation. So it's very challenging to introduce the whole show in 20 minutes, but I, I think I end up here first. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Pili. And thank you, Iko. I am going to, maybe we can get everybody back or get uh, Iko and Pili at least um, back on the screen. Um, and one of the things I want to say right now, because I will start with a question or two, but I really would like the audience to ask questions. We um, uh, don't have very many, but I um, assume that to, once I ask an introductory question, um, people will have some time to think about what questions that they have. So please, please put your questions in the Q&A and we look forward to uh, having a lively conversation. Um, I probably, I mean, I have so many questions for each of you, but 
Um, perhaps what I can uh, ask to both of you um, to start this off is these are incredibly, both of your presentations are incredibly rich. And I had the wonderful opportunity, as you both know, to see the opening shows and um, was really um, thrilled and excited. Um, but, you know, almost a little overwhelmed by the amount of material, by the amount of artworks um, by um, that there was on, on, um, on display. And, you know, I felt like I needed to go back um, and I wanted to go back and I did go back a couple of times, but again, as I said, um, the audience, I mean, there were so many people um, in, the, in the exhibitions, in the, in the museum that it was even, you know, difficult to see, but, um, what, um, but I look forward to going back and I hope that everybody, once we can get a plane back to Hong Kong, will hop on the next available flight and go back and see your shows. Um, but the, the questions that I have for both of you, two, um, the same question is, um, these are incredibly rich exhibitions, incredibly um, uh, dense, complex, interesting uh, exhibitions. Going forward, um, what kind of exhibitions do you think about or what kind of sort of perhaps more focused shows um, do you think about or exhibitions that you think about that you could um, imagine doing in the future or want to do in the future? Hopefully not too soon because you want to wait for all of us to come and see the opening shows. But from the experience you've had with the material now and from the collections, what other ideas have generated from this experience? What new ideas do you have um, that maybe you didn't have prior to working on these two exhibitions and prior to working on these collections? So what new ideas do you have or new ideas for exhibitions or surprises um, that you, or questions that you'd like to explore further? Keely, um, Ika, why don't you start? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, sure. I mean, it is, a, it is a lot and we also kind of bit eager to want to put everything. We know that totally. And then also we knew it's this is exhibition people to, you know, to make a habit to the museum. It's not like just, you know, one visit done. It's, we wanted to really communicate to the audience. This is the toolbox for you. I mean, of course, the tourist, maybe it's difficult, but it's also as a local museum. So it is a, like, a, you know, we want to make a habit them to school groups to come back with the teachers and then, you know, that maybe you go with school group but the weekend come back with a boyfriend or you bring your grandma and so forth. So that's also a little bit strategic wise. I mean, that was my personally wanted to introducing museum culture to, to, to for their toolbox. That's one idea, but for, but it's also created a lot of frustration as you can see, because it's, you know, it's, um, we can't, I can't write a 500 label text. So no one going to read that. So, so it's again a frustration, our, this, the fantastic story behind each work, I can't fully unpack. Uh, but the, it's the display and design and the, the architecture, it's quite different than visual art because we need to juxtaposition and cluster them, make it kind of uh, to tell in a little bit like a social background, why this has to happen, what's the impact. So, so that part to, to telling, unpacking the story more, not just by describing what it is to that part. We did a um, uh, lot of with the help with the kind of contextual images and the historical footages, the videos and the whole forth, but it's not really, I feel enough. So, so it's, it's my kind of the next step is really, uh, now I'm observing as the wild museums open, I went to almost every day down in the gallery to really watching what people are reacting, how they're seeing. And um, uh, so, it's, so it's more like, a, for me, it's a few works, but I really want to unpack the, but it's also the processes, you know, because the design is, you can do the anatomy of things, you know, think like that, that's I can imagine. Good. Keely, what are your thoughts? What what you're an expert? You you are you are an expert and have been for a long time of Chinese art. What did you learn from these, and what new things do you want to do? 
Yeah, I just feel like uh, thank you for the question, and I totally share the feeling like eco. Like we working for the museum for so long time that in the moment we nearly forget that the opening of the museum is just the beginning. Just like we always say, okay, we make sure when then we are done. So as uh, there are several things here, I think the first of all is like uh, we have the zig collection of. of and, and we have like a, two more shows talking about the specifically about the chance contemporary art in future. As we can say, like uh, for me, like the first show give you the brief like uh, historical survey of the whole horror show. But other than that, we want to also touch upon several like a major like how besides of like this kind of structure where they know like a city tourism, political pop, globalization, how can we invoke or trigger the most more um, meaningful, more uh, different understanding to Chinese art in the background of such like uh, how we bring the Chinese art in the landscape of the globalization, global art, and how Chinese art be connected to the first modernization happened in the first uh, the earlier half of the 20th century. So that's really like we want to rethink about the this MPAS is a visual culture museum for the 20th and the 21st sand, sand century. We cannot only choosing like uh, isolated Chinese art in like a like a Western impact China react and how those China in elements trigger the another modernization that's the one thing and the other thing like uh, for a long time we explain Chinese art as kind of like a Western impact China react or like all the Chinese meaningful change from the traditional China to a modern China but uh, as we see as well as really showed we show the collection in and plus in the global landscape. We see there are many other cha channels, circulation, exchange happen. And we really want to unfold in this, um, unpacking this uh, connect, connect, connection um, in our future pro programs. Not about China and the rest of the world, but also like a visual art, architecture, the, 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 the design, even like a popular culture, culture things. Yeah. Great. Well, I'm now looking at lots of questions. So um, people have had time. And a lot of the questions have has to do with audience. Um, who, who do you think your audience is? Is it a Hong Kong audience? Is it an international audience? Um, uh, how are the audience responding to this? Um, are there different kinds of responses from different kinds of audiences? Um, how is the government responding? Whoever you know, the government is, how is a, uh, perhaps um, you know, a local uh, government or other governments are responding to this? Um, so, you know, who's the audience and what have the responses been? And perhaps you can also talk about how many people have walked in the door. Um, Nico, how about okay. you? Uh, yeah, I think it's very, I mean, positive. I mean, the, the start with the number was, it was a little bit overwhelming for us as well, because we, of course, when we start Imagine a Museum, we were, you know, there was no pandemic was in place. So we were thinking totally the you know that the audience is both from Hong Kong and then the global international because Hong Kong was the you know it's it's a, Hong Kong is very one of the largest transit hub in Asia. So we have like a it's a lot of tourists all the time. So we were imagining very mixed group of audience. So, but of course what's happened was that the Hong Kong local audience almost 100 percent because it was the um, of people living in Hong Kong and then but was the what I'm impressed is Hong Kong people are so curious. It's nothing like the cities I used to live in Stockholm or Tokyo, and then you know from the kids to like young couple to elderly group, and then because people are just there's no bias to oh I have to go to the museum. I don't understand the museum. I don't know what the museum is. People are just more more like you know because already I have seen that because Hong Kong art Basel it's the public days are popular. It's almost like a going to the fairgrounds attractions, you know, so people are very, very curious audience. So which that's, I think it's incredibly happy to see, you know, so they really came. And then I think it's a museum. It's also helping the way 
you know, PD shows and my show, there's many other exhibitions, but we have a lot of other spaces in the museum. So it's quite a nice place to, we introduce as a museum kind of chilling out space than just see the exhibition. That's, I think it's helping to uh, broaden the uh, new audience. Yeah, uh, following that, I, I think that's a very good question for, for Chinese art in the M plus election. I would say like to answer the question, like uh, I, I'm very con confident and honest to say like uh, the whole opening display of the M plus collection was the, the final list was produced, was already confirmed four, four years ago. So by the museum or, or open, we didn't make any change, even whatever happened outside of the museum. So that's part of the answer your question, what's the government's attitude uh, to M plus uh, show or the whole, the whole program? I, 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 I would say the critical freedom and the critical, the boundary is very clear there. We didn't change any of our checklist. That's the one, one thing. But the other thing is also quite interesting when you talk about the, how the audience react. I, I, I think it's also quite interesting for us. It's like uh, one thing we want to see how the international media react. I mean, for me, sometimes um, I'm quite upset. Like uh, when we open the show, always people say, okay, they will censor our way. They will not censor our way. The most of the ridiculous re 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 review I read is like a, a secret show. It's a great show because they are not only show one our way. They now now showing two. So it's kind of like they they judge our show by how many our way piece we are showing. I mean, people too uh, international media wise, they are too much focused on this kind of like a, like a pol political sensibility that sometimes make us a little bit uh, feel weird, but I, I think once the border reopen, people come to see the show, I, I think that the reception will ch change a lot. But on the other hand, I also feel like uh, if the six show open in Hong, in Hong Kong for the last uh, six, uh, several months, we received like uh, almost the 30,000, uh, 300,000 audience in the first two months, nearly like 10,000 audience every, every day. But the quite interesting question is like for me, even like, uh, yeah, whose audience? I, I mean, for me as a creator, it's like a major like idea, like uh, the audience in our mind from the idea audience to a uh, individual audience. The idea audience means that they know contemporary art, that they know, uh, uh, appreciate that with their open mind. That's our setting for audience. But in fact, we know the whole world, political wise, culture wise, being divided so, so much. And the museum is no longer a mutual place for many people. So you can see some artists really, some audience really appreciate that. that. But you, can, you, you also can see some very angry audience feel that being humiliated. So I, I, I think that's normal. And also I, I, I'm really happy to see we have the audience. It's, it's not a single audience any, any, anymore. There are millions of the individuals not to mention Hong Kong still hasn't opened the border to China. And, uh, and we, we, we basically in the last, last two months, we only received the audience here. So I would say like the audience quite, uh, we are quite uh, multiple. There are, there are multiple individuals with different uh, background and standing bias or interest. So we are as a museum, we open here, we open almost like a, forever, we'll be ready to face that. Right. Um, we're running out of time and we have lots of questions. Um, one was a kind of an interesting one. Maybe this is the one that I can get um, both of you to talk to. Um, and I think it is um, part of the mission or at least the early vision for M plus um, that as you know, I was, uh, that I'm quite aware of. Um, the question is about, um, it came out of the wonderful presentation, and thank you very much, was the, the questioner that Eco did about um, design. Um, but one of the uh, observations perhaps that this uh, person had was that they seem to be um, a sort of separation between design on one hand, you know, fine art on another hand. Um, a little bit, they said, like a MoMA model. Um, 
And I you know, remember, and I think it's still very much in, in our hearts or your hearts about the future of M plus was to create this conversations to not to, to blur the borders, um, to put art in context of real life life. Um, so design speaks to fine arts, it speaks to architecture, it speaks to moving image, it speaks to through in an, in an interdisciplinary and porous um, fashion. My question to you is, in your curatorial um, conversations, as you conceive of exhibitions and you conceive of collection building, is it a joint enterprise? You could maybe speak a little bit about how those decisions are made and how do you think about, or do you think about um, creating opportunities to display, let's say the rice cooker next to um, an art that was happening in Taiwan, let's say at the time that Dot Fong was creating that rice cooker or the um, sushi bar and you know what was happening in abstract art or design um, in Japan alongside of uh, something else that might be happening in uh, the fine arts or the moving image field in China or India for that matter. So I just would like to, you to think a little bit about that and maybe talk to us about that is how these curatorial decisions and what is the plan for um, the conversation that, and dialogue between different types of art and, uh, and cultures. Uh, is that I start? Yes. Yeah. Thank you for very good questions. And then it's absolutely the, the, yeah, the greatest uh, the question to really also actually to the aspect which we wasn't able to show to you today because it's the beginning of the, the PD already mentioned about this as a visual culture museum. So as a new museum, we start from 21st century. So we are, we can't, it's no longer, we can't divide the genres and disciplines. So we have a only one curatorial team. So we, of course we have a, the, it's not departmentalized. So to say, we have, of course, this, because of our knowledge and the networks, we have a teams. But when we, anything we acquire, our the acquisition committee is just one all together. So, so then also when we, so to say, when we kind of argue the pitch, why I won't have this rice cooker, then kind of, we always try to put the, exactly as you said, what's been happening in the, the, the visual art time that, you know, the, around that time. And then, so we were actually already when we acquired in the works, we are already putting together, juxtaposing the visual art, moving image and design in the same history. So that's a very big, our effort of collection building. But however, for this time, it didn't uh, ended up in the form of exhibition. Uh, it, it, it's a lot of aspects uh, because was the, the, which we really needed to start with something the very, uh, you know, the fundamental, like uh, the basic uh, like to give an idea, what is museum collection, what is also discipline. So it was a little bit like uh, the first step. And then, so in the beginning of the, our curatorial, this opening exhibition, we've been working all together. We had probably five exhibitions all interdisciplinary, you know, but then it became, hmm, it's become probably a bit too confusing when we're thinking about audience. So, so in the end, so we decide to kind of uh, focusing. So, so this time it is uh, divided more. So it looks like a bit art, but it's actually, it's the thankful reminder. It was a bit my mistake. I didn't think that actually the, my gallery also have a child face RMB city's entire archive. That's totally child face touches like intersect with you know, video games and a visual culture and economic boom and kind of imaginative cities. It's, it speaks a lot between design and architecture. So we actually have a very big section of Chao Fei in the gallery. So it's happening also to have a dialogue with PD's C collection and then my, so we did the, the there's a little bit there. And, uh, but it's, you know, it happened to really manifest it's enough on the display for this exhibition. Yeah, I just had one thing to add in that, as I said, the opening of the museum is just the beginning, just like uh, we have the opening show, we are so eager about to share 
our collection in many ways, but also for the Z collection, we have a very special, we have our commitment to Docker to make that show uh, for three of them. But we also, also triggered those kind of questions, especially in our text and images section, but also to really realize our vision to you know, as a visual culture museum. It's really need a lot of time, need a lot of the solid, uh, research acquisition, but we can find at some point in future we will connect this kind of the, such like a sustainability, landscape, shan, shan, shan shui, ink, and the architect. There are many things we can do in that. So sometimes one show cannot solve all the problem, but you have make one, one should solve another one. And just quickly to add on this, so which we're not showing, so it's the, our colleague Tina Pang curated, we have yeah. the show Hong Kong Here and Beyond, which is primarily focusing Hong Kong visual culture. In that exhibition, it's exactly the happening, you know, the design architecture, urbanism and the visual art and the moving image in one exhibition. Excellent, that is, that is ex exactly right. You're right about that. Um, well, all I can say is, I mean, we're we've, we're we're past our deadline um, of nine o'clock, but I think we could go on obviously all night. I think it's so exciting to hear that you've gotten three hundred thousand people so far, um, and that sadly you've had to close. Um, you've been closed now for about six weeks, I understand, um, for the uh, because of the COVID surge uh, in Hong Kong. Um, but we are all so excited um, and we're all going to get on the next available plane, uh, you know, flight if, when, it, when, it, when it happens. It will happen, but when it happens. And I'm glad to hear that the exhibition will be prolonged. Can you perhaps maybe, Pili, you could say something about um, what, when, when will this opening exhibition that you all have spent so much time on for years at least, yeah. Um, when will this opening exhibition um, it, at the moment um, is projected to close? Yeah, I, I think we have the deep, deep run the closing date for the deep, deep, deep run the section of the shows. But so far for this moment, we know like most of the show will be per prolonged for another year. I mean, uh, and the Hong Kong uh, and the, like a Z collection show uh, will prolonged to the next two July in the 2024. And the uh, eco, the East Gallery and the South Gallery, they even have a more longer time there. I think more like to the autumn of the 2024. So basically, I hope the whole world will resume to normal very soon. And we are very eager to welcome all of you in Hong Kong. Well, on that, I think um, we just have to congratulate you. I've gotten um, on the, on the Q&A, there is just a many, many congratulations. Um, and thank yous for this wonderful presentation. And everybody I know is so eager um, to come and, and see for themselves what you have just given us a little bit of a hint on. So yeah. thank you both very, very much. Um, and bravo to the curatorial team, to Sahanya, the director, um, and the huge number of people who are, who are support in the support functions, as well as um, the sort of, um, the larger, the larger, the larger group of people in Hong Kong who should be congratulated for supporting this incredible, incredible project. So thank you very much, night, and good night to good night and good morning to both of you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye bye. bye, -bye. Have a good evening.